Uh, my name is Mark Tushnet. I'm a professor at the law school. Uh, this uh, panel is, in some sense, a preview of uh, a, a conference that, uh, that we'll be holding in May in Delhi uh, with an eye to producing a book about South Asian constitutionalism or constitutionalism in South Asia. Uh, and uh, that conference is supported by the uh, South Asia uh, Institute and the Harvard Law School, for whose support we're quite grateful. Um, I, want, I will start with a few words about the motivation for the conference, uh, and then we'll have presentations that will discuss some aspects of the themes that we'll be developing when we're there. Uh, obviously, we uh, don't know what people will uh, concretely present there, so we have just some sketches of uh, what people will be doing. Uh, and then uh, at, at the end, I may, if we have time, say a few words about uh, some themes that seem to have emerged from the preliminary uh, discussions that we've had. Um, the motivation for the conference actually comes from two directions. Uh, one is specifically focused on South Asia, uh, and that is that there's a sense, uh, uh, we have a sense, that uh, Madhav and I who put it together, have a sense that uh, there are uh, interesting developments occurring with respect to constitutions in South Asia uh, that are responses to a set of, uh, I, that I would say with some qualifications, common problems. Uh, problems of constitutional design and implementation uh, arising out of the interaction among uh, development issues, uh, uh, ethnic conflict, and social disorder of a sort not connected to ethnic conflict. Um, and and there, there, there are things happening. Uh, or people thinking about how constitutional systems could be designed so as to address these kinds of things. So there's a sort of, we had a sense that there was, in some sense, a common project that be, could be called constitutions in South Asia. Um, my, uh, uh, the second direction uh, that uh, motivates this comes from my own primary uh, I don't know, focus, I do comparative constitutional law. Um, and that is uh, a very strong sense that the field which has developed or redeveloped over the past 20 years uh, is and remains um, excessively Eurocentric, uh, where Eurocentric includes the United States and Canada and many uh, former British uh, Commonwealth nations. There are a variety of reasons for why that's happened, uh, uh, but, but uh, it, seemed, it seems to me that it's extremely important for the development of the field of comparative constitutional law that the domain, the geographic domain, uh, be expanded. Um, before, uh, uh, oh, I, and I, one, uh, specific component of that that's at the inter intersection between these first two themes uh, is uh, that there's an interesting, in some sense, parallel uh, between uh, some aspects of con comparative constitutional work in South Asia and m the focus that I have on comparative constitutional work sort of in the United States. Uh, if you think about the development of constitutional law in Canada, um, there's a very strong, um, it's not quite pull, but interaction with uh, US thinking about constitutions. Uh, and there's something similar to that in South Asia with respect to the Indian constitution. And so it might be interesting for us when we uh, hold the conference to examine or to think about the precise role that India has as a either direct influence or as a mental image uh, in constitutional development uh, elsewhere. Um, the uh, final thing I want to say before turning it over to uh, uh, Professor Lawati uh, is uh, that I do want to note something that will come up in the conversations. Uh, 
I define the field as uh, a field of comparative constitutional law and not, for example, cons uh, comparative politics. By defining the field in that way, uh, you generate a, I think, distinctive approach uh, in which issues of law take priority in thinking about institutional responses to these issues of development and conflict and so on. Uh, law, as, uh, law as a way of thinking about institutional design rather than, for example, issues of power as influencing uh, institutional design. Although, as you'll see, I think, in our conversation, uh, the latter, these issues of power aren't ignored. Uh, but it is very striking to me when I interact with uh, people who do comparative work, whose primary training is in political science, that for me, the first thing I think about is what does the law say? Uh, and for them, the first thing they think about is what are the power relations? Now, eventually, you know, some degree of convergence, but the fields are sufficiently different that I think it important to flag this uh, at, at the outset. Uh, with that, I will turn the uh, panel over to first uh, Professor Lawati, and then uh, Madhav Kosla, and then uh, Suji Chowdhury. Around 15 minutes? Uh, 15 minutes, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tosnet and uh, Mada for inviting me to the project. And thank you, the Southeast Institute, for inviting me uh, <coughs> to the conference. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is how constitutionalism has developed in Nepal. You might be surprised, Nepal is probably, I haven't checked this out, but uh, one of the countries that has had very high number of constitutions. Uh, Nepal had four, six formal constitutions. They were trying to frame the seventh one, which they haven't been able to, and so on. And I look at it from more, more from a comparative politics uh, perspective, in the sense that's how I'm trained and how I look at things and so on. Uh, so that's what I will be doing. And just to, I mean, provide the background, the recent controversies, background, and so on, like uh, Nepal uh, elected a constituent assembly in 2008. After four years, it was dissolved because it was not uh, uh, able to frame a constitution. And the constituent <laughs> assembly was largely, I mean, formed to meet the Maoist rebels' demand, because they wanted a constituent assembly to frame a new constitution. But ironically, what has happened is, now the constitution was not made, not because of ideological power relations, ideological or class-based contestations, <coughs> but rather because the contestation that was not being able to bridge was on identity issues. So it is not class issues, it has become a more uh, identity uh, issues and so on. So uh, that says that perhaps, I mean, uh, at least during the process of constitution writing, uh, identity politics has become a major, uh, the most contested issue that led to the dissolution of the constituent assembly. Now, since because, I mean, identity issues, I just wanted to give a brief background. I mean, there are more than 100 languages, more than 100 ethnic uh, caste groups in Nepal, and this is just a major uh, breakdown of categories. The indigenous nationalities, around 36%, but more than 60 or more than even 80 uh, groups. They are divided into hill, mountain, and tarai, or madhis. Then there are Dalit who are uh, from the hills, from the Tarai or Madhesh. Then there are Madheshi who are uh, Hindus from the plains. Uh, in Nepal, there's a very, very big distinction between Hindus from the plains and Hindus from the hills. Hindus from the hills are the ru ruling group, have been the ruling group. Uh, Hindus from the plains have been one of the excluded groups as well. And then there are Muslims and so on. So, and uh, uh, the caste, what I call the caste hill Hindu elite group has been the dominant group which has ruled Nepal for the last two and a half centuries I mean, uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> control over resources, control over power, in terms of cultural identity markers and matters, they have been the dominant one. 
and the rest, including Madeshi Hindus, uh, were excluded from power. Uh, their cultures and lifestyles and so on were discriminated over here. So this is just as a background why identity issue has become very salient uh, in Nepal. Now, uh, uh, Constituent Assembly, why did it, uh, how did it um, in, uh, fail to write a con um, constitution, produce a constitution, even after four years of deliberation? There are many reasons, uh, but the, as I said, the final proximate cause I have been arguing is that the ruling elite who control the political parties, who, who, are, who dominate the judiciary, the bureaucracy, the media, and everything else, they did not abide by the democratic <coughs> process, uh, which was laid down in the interim constitution, saying that uh, two-third of the majority, if there is a two-third on a majority on any issue, that should be uh, adopted by the constitution. Because what happened, I'll just list out uh, three major uh, issues that, uh, that is more, more or less clear. First, oh, sorry, I was trying to take <coughs> over here in my... First, what happened was uh, the Constituent Assembly's thematic committee that was supposed to deliberate on the structure of governance ultimately produced a uh, uh, favor, a uh, recommended a model with majority that would recognize, that would award autonomy to multiple identity groups, Madhisi, indigenous nationalities, and so on. But since the political parties who are Hill Bahun, mean, meaning Hill Brahmin, they didn't, they didn't favor that model, then they said, let us form the State Structuring Commission, which earlier they had been refusing to form, because they thought if they formed State Restructuring Commission, they had to ensure representation of different groups, and that would produce a model, federal, adopt a federal model that they may not like. But since the Constituent Assembly's thematic committee came up with a model that the leaders did not like, then they went on to form the State Restructuring Commission. The commission also again deliberated and came with a model that also again uh, favored the idea, I mean, uh, autonomy to multiple groups, uh, Madhishi and indigenous nationalities and all, so on. And again, they were reluctant to I mean, uh, take, take this forward. They refused to take it to the uh, floor of the CA. And in fact, they, uh, they even didn't do that when more than two-thirds of the uh, members of the Constituent Assembly signed a petition saying that they favor the identity model, uh, meaning uh, a federal model that would provide uh, autonomy to multiple groups and so on. And instead, I mean, they went and dissolved, uh, instead of voting on the issue, uh, if the, uh, they dissolved uh, the uh, CA. So what that uh, basically says is that, I mean, they were, I mean, they, they didn't follow the democratic process, and they were, I mean, interested in dissolving the Constituent Assembly rather than adopt a model that uh, they did not uh, favor. And just one, to point out one thing, I think it would be fair to assume, and I think many people in Nepal would agree, that if in this three process, either in the CA committee, the commission, or in the house, if the leaders had the, uh, their support or majority or two-third majority, they would have readily, I mean, preferred the model uh, that they would have uh, wanted. So this is uh, just, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, pointing you the background on the, uh, why Nepal could not, was not able to uh, frame the constitution. And uh, this is a chart that uh, has uh, the six constitutions in Nepal when they were, I mean, uh, framed. And I include two what I call proto-constitutions. One in 1854, uh, uh, Nepal uh, was given a country code, Muluki N, which basically codified Hindu caste laws as laws of the land and imposed it throughout the country. And before that, the conqueror of Nepal, Prithvi Narayan Shah, well, uh, before he died, he had given what he's called Dibya Upadesh, meaning guidance and governance, nationalism, and so on. So since uh, that also basically guides, uh, guided the uh, polity, I also include it as a proto-constitution. And in this, what I will, I will uh, my plan is to, I have included this, I mean, uh, 
the time, the nature of the constitution, and, and so on. And over here, I also want to include how the people uh, accepted it, reacted it, ignored it, and, and so on. Through, I mean, I'm trying to look at resistances, rebellions, and so on. It's not a very good indicator, but something, I mean, that I still plan to uh, work with. Uh, in terms of how people uh, reacted or accepted uh, those constitutions and so on. But overall, what I want to point out in this, from this chart is, what you see is Prithibi Naran Saad, the guy who conquered Nepal, he had declared Nepal as Asali Hindustan, pure uh, Hindu country, mm -hmm. partly because um, for various reasons. Uh, and, but at that time, he had accommodated different uh, groups that he had conquered or he had uh, uh, made treaties for those groups to be incorporated into his new kingdom. So autonomy was given uh, by Prithvi Narensa at that time. But as the years progressed and as the state consolidated, what happened was the autonomy, customary laws of different groups were slowly, I mean, undermined, weakened. And, and that, that's what generally happens in other countries, state building process also. And in Nepal also we see uh, that uh, autonomy, uh, customary laws being undermined. And finally, in 1964, uh, formally autonomy uh, to the limbus of the East were finally uh, taken away formally through the new uh, country code and so on. So one major distinction I want to make is, till 1990, the aim of the constitutions, or uh, uh, the objective of the constitution and the uh, rulers at that time, was to make Nepal a nation state. Uh, and they defined by 1990, by 1962, when they said Nepal nation, they meant that uh, those who followed the uh, hill Hindu culture, who spoke Nepali, who wore, who wore the dress of the Hill, Hill, Hill Hindus, Daura Sural, Nepali Topis, and, and so on. So that was the aim uh, till 1990. Uh, but then uh, in 2007, you see a okay, thank you, uh, dramatic uh, change in that uh, the notion of nation state uh, was not agreeable to the Madhisis, to the indigenous nationalities, even to Muslims, and to some extent, even to Dalits. So that way, whenever Nepal obtained democracy, there had been challenges uh, against uh, the state's uh, attempt to uh, develop uh, or uh, impose uh, the notion of uh, Nepali <coughs> nation state. So just these are some, uh, some of the uh, salient, I mean, uh, features of the constitutionalism in Nepal from the 1780s to 1990. Hindu state, Hindu monarchy, Khaskura, or that later on has now become known as the Nepali language, uh, hill upper caste Hindu culture, again, not, uh, not uh, Hindu culture of the Madeshi, but of the hills, Daurasrawala and Topi as national dress. This is again the dress of the ru ruling group public holidays on Hill Hindu festivals, Hill Hindu nationalism, uh, and so on. So these were the, I mean, salient features of the uh, nation state model that the uh, constitutions were trying to create. Oh, sorry, I had been, uh, I had been uh, I'm confusing with the uh, clicker and my uh, PowerPoint. So th these were the I mean, things I was trying to show. Now, as I said, uh, the major change occurred in 2007 interim constitution. This constitution came after the Second People's Movement when uh, the king was kind of, I mean, forced to give up power by the combination of the parliamentary parties, civil societies organization, and the Maoists, who collectively uh, uh, forced him to quit. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, Nepal became a republic in place of Hindu kingdom, secular state in place of Hindu state. From unitary state, there has been a commitment towards adopting federalism. Uh, from the first past the post system to a mixed system, including PR, uh, which has ensured higher representation of Dalit, women, Madhishi, indigenous nationalities into the CA, and reservation to Dalit, indigenous Madhishi, women, and uh, others. 
and citizenships were distributed in 2007 for two and a half million people, mostly Madishi and others as well. Native, all native languages were designated as national language. Earlier it was not the case, only Nepali was designated as such. Now public holidays have been given to all uh, on other groups, religions, festivals, and so on. So basically this has happened after in the interim constitution and uh, in the laws. Uh, that have come down from uh, the interim constitution. So what we see is uh, emergence of uh, a multi-nation state from what Nepal was used to be a nation state. So again, this is what I have uh, already mentioned, uh, that uh, uh, during the autocratic years, the rulers tried to impose a nation state. During the democratic years, uh, when people got space, different groups challenged. And ultimately, in 2006, the king was weakened. And after the, uh, after the change, with the support of the Maoist, who supported many of these reform agendas, uh, the new constitution now has become much more inclusive uh, than before, uh, and so on. So the final hurdle is now, if the federal model uh, that provides autonomy to multiple groups is adopted, then that would, I think, establish a multi-nation state. But as I said earlier, that's still, I mean, highly contested. Uh, the political leadership uh, as of now are strictly against it. Uh, they have undermined the democratic process. They have used the power to not uh, take the issue to the votes and so on. And finally, I mean, in my last paper, uh, I just had whether uh, they have uh, uh, called for a new election, whether, I mean, the new election would be able to draft a constitution or not. Uh, since I'm running out of time, I mean, uh, I will not uh, dwell into this, but if anyone is interested, we can discuss about these things uh, uh, subsequently. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to sort of continue a little from what Professor Tashnet spoke about and just, um, just kind of hope to highlight what were the various themes that we were, we were looking for this conference to bring to light. Some, I'll, I'll speak primarily about India only because that's the region, that, that's the country in the region that I know best. And some of, the, some of the developments that we focus on are things that a lot of us are familiar with already. In, um, in daily news, um, dramatic economic change, democratic pressures, and so forth. What's, what, what was interesting to Professor Tashnet um, and I was how, how a lot of these developments also paralleled a range of dramatic new legal changes that we probably haven't seen in the last 60 years of Indian constitutionalism other than maybe in the 50s and in the 70s. The most striking of those, I think, is um, is 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 on the is is sort of the real growth of a new rights-based architecture, um, and so we've seen that in the last few years with the right to education. Now there's a movement towards the right to food and so forth. And it'll be a lot of these, a lot of once all these are set into stone, it will be interesting to see what shape they take. Um, a lot of the debate is sort of carried out in, um, in very polarizing terms, but the truth is it's very, very difficult to say. And, um, and in a lot of the statutes that we find and a lot of the constitutional amendments that are taking place, there's a lot of specificity that's actually set in stone. And so you, you might actually, for instance, find out 30 or 40 years later after, after all of this is done, that a lot of these systems have actually sort of validated Benthamite fears of rights giving, re rights resulting in very illiberal outcomes. Or you might instead find that this has genuinely created a very efficient new welfare state, and it's too soon to say. But the interesting thing for us was that a lot of these are the product of two or three years of dramatic legal activism, and, um, and, and a lot of those are sort of coming into place very, very quickly. And they're going to change the role of the courts. They're going to change the role of litigants. They're going to change the way, the, really, the role that constitutional law plays in Indian public life. 
The second sort of change that, the, um, that we have been noticing, and in a sense this is related, is of course claims in India, and as Professor Lohati's presentation vividly depicted, just on questions of representation. And um, these are certainly not new questions in India, and they're not new questions in South Asia at all. But what is striking is that these que the debate on representation has now taken a very different turn as a result of economic change. Because the state isn't the only vehicle of modernity. The state is no longer the center of Indian public life. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's going to give rise to very different kinds of claims. And, and, and really what, what Professor Tashin and I were hoping to capture was how, how these will mold constitutional law in South Asia in the years to come. For instance, um, one of the things that economic change has done, and this is far less talked about in Indian legal circles, is that it's really, um, it's really made tense a debate about, about federalism and not only fiscal federalism, because in the 50s, a lot of the federal debates were about, were about the autonomy of particular regions. And, um, and a lot of those were based either on sort of very strong historical reasons, Jammu and Kashmir being the most famous, or some kind of linguistic identity. A lot of the new claims now are actually being articulated in different ways, almost as if to suggest that the central challenge for federalism is how to identify the appropriate level at which certain functions of government can be best performed. And, um, and that's a very different kind of argument. And it's also the reason why, for instance, the 73rd and 74th amendments to the Indian Constitution haven't really, um, haven't really sort of engendered an elaborate legal outcome because nobody's very clear on what they mean. Nobody's very clear on whether they actually devolve state power or on whether they just empower the state to give power to local governments and so forth. Part of the motivation also, and something that we do hope to focus on, is the fact that a lot of South Asian constitutionalism is caricatured around rights-based issues, and so public interest litigation, and sort of you have these you know, 20 efficient activist lawyers who go to the Supreme Court and then suddenly everybody's lives are better. And, it, um, and really there's much more happening in the region than that would suggest. It's not clear, for instance, whether any of those rights revolutions, I mean, in and of themselves, have actually led to dramatic outcomes. It's not to say that they haven't. It's just to say that the kind of work that people like Gerald Rosenberg or so many others did in the US just hasn't been done in India. And, um, and so we just don't really know what kind of, what kind of impact those, those things are happening. I mean, it's also, I think, I think it's, it, it's apparent to, to possibly anybody who studies Indian, Indian politics or Indian law that the problem isn't really the legal regime, right? I mean, it seems to be, um, I mean, it's, it's somewhat disconcerting, for instance, that in all of the recent rape controversy, the focus seems to be on a new rape law, uh, almost as if the legal regime earlier made rape easy. Um, so the, so a, a, a lot of what we were also hoping to focus on was to move beyond that. So for instance, to look at issues like federalism, to look at the real rise of the administrative and regulatory state. Um, the reason why we looked at Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, um, Nepal, and India was that not, not so much because each of these countries is dealing with the same question. I mean, I think I think that's, that, that's plainly untrue. But I think that, as, as Professor Rashan had alluded to, what is interesting about each of these countries is that it seems to be that there is, that legal controversies now occupy a central role in political life. And um, I mean, we see that vividly in Pakistan, where the court in the last three or four years has, um, has acquired a life of its own. But we also see that in Nepal, as Professor Lohati just showed us, or in Sri Lanka, where one is simply not able to arrive at a legal arrangement that is actually amenable to all parties. Um, the Bangladesh story is more complicated after the early 1990s, but we, I mean, one of the things that we hope to capture is, and this is actually very striking, is just the extent to which, um, the extent to which legal disputes 
about who constitutes the election commission have shaped electoral outcomes in Bangladesh. And that's actually very interesting because, I mean, those of us who study comparative constitutional law are always struck by India's election commission, which is unique in a sense, because it's one of the few um, bodies that operates outside the traditional tripartite executive legislature judiciary structure. And for all the corruption in Indian public life, it's actually somehow seemed to done better than a lot of the others. Um, I, th I think it is, it, it is important to just sort of briefly mention just before I, I do close that the, I, I mean, and, and I hope that Pro Professor Ashton will agree with this, but I, I don't think any of us hope to suggest that there's something dramatically exotic about South Asian constitutionalism. Sometimes there's a tendency to do this. I, I, I mean, I look at a lot of these debates as implicating debates that are central to democracy anywhere in the world. But I think what is striking about the region and something that we hope to bring out is that people are struggling with and trying to find, often successfully, often unsuccessfully, innovative ways to actually negotiate the same questions. And I think the Election Commission is only one example of that. And it will be interesting to see sort of as, as those debates play out, and I think it's I think it's always too soon to tell in some ways, but as those debates play out, it'll be interesting to see how they how they make us rethink some key assumptions of of Western constitutional thought. Um, one of um, one lovely line by Sunil Kelani that I that I that I that has always stayed with me is that the future of Western political thought will be determined outside the West. And perhaps that might be true for um, for constitutional thought as well. Thanks. Um, so thank you to uh, to Mark and Madhav uh, both for conceiving of this project and for inviting me to participate in it. So as I see it, this project has a, a double mandate. Uh, the first mandate is uh, to take stock uh, and to offer a synthetic account of the constitutional dimensions of economic development, social change, and political conflict across South Asia. But, but the second dimension, which is I, I would think is as important, is about intellectual agendas. That is, it, it's about how to think about studying South Asia as a topic in comparative constitutional law uh, and comparative constitutional politics. Uh, and that's almost as important uh, as the first topic. So what I want to do is, is focus my remarks on the second um, issue or theme by setting out a, a series of propositions. Uh, and they're propositions of different kinds. They're, they're propositions about the state of the literature. Uh, they're propositions about uh, method, uh, about the type of the, the topics that we study, um, the institutional focus of our analyses, source materials that we rely on, uh, the role of comparative analysis in, in this type of work, uh, what the objects of com comparison are, uh, both uh, within and across South Asia, but also outside South Asia, uh, who is engaging in that process of comparison? Uh, is it scholars and analysts, or is it constitutional actors, or is it both? Uh, and then the, what, the, what the point or purpose of this type of work might be, uh, whether it's analytical, or whether it's prescriptive, or whether it's a combination of the two. Uh, and then finally, uh, what uh, future directions are for scholarship uh, in this area. So, so let me start by kind of describing the status quo. So I, I, I think that all of us on this panel would agree uh, that South Asia is largely neglected uh, in the large and growing literature on comparative constitu constitutional law. Uh, it's a very vibrant field. Uh, it's increasingly active, uh, but it's very narrow uh, in its substantive focus and in the jurisdictions that command central attention. So substantively, uh, comparative constitutional law focuses largely on what we call the rights revolution, uh, which is the relationship between universal human rights, democracy, and judicial review uh, within a liberal democratic constitutional order. And this has generated a series of specific debates that are very energetic uh, on uh, a whole range of issues, uh, such as whether jurisdictions should adopt adopt a justiciable bill of rights, uh, the institutional arrangements that surround the enforcement of those texts, whether such texts should include socioeconomic rights, uh, the horizontal application of bills of rights to private relations, uh, and the use of comparative materials in constitutional interpretation. Uh, the jurisdictions that organize this field are, are generally very limited in number. Uh, South Africa, Israel, Germany, Canada, New Zealand, uh, the United Kingdom, and the United States. 
Uh, and the institutional focus or source material that's relied on for the most part, um, it consists mostly of court judgments and, and some constitutional texts. And so if you look then at South Asia, um, there, there are problems with how South Asia has been received uh, into the literature uh, that parallels the structural characteristics uh, of the literature. Uh, so jurisdictionally, uh, South Asia is neglected as a, as a category or as a set of countries. Uh, the only country that has generated high quality comparative work is India. Uh, and then substantively, um, the questions focused on the literature on India primarily uh, are informed by questions raised in the constitutional law and politics um, of jurisdictions around which the field is structured, as opposed to being an intellectual agenda that is driven by India itself, or, or what happens on the ground in South Asian jurisdictions more generally. Uh, so I'll give you three examples, right? So Gal Galantner's Competing Equalities, um, the definitive work on reservations, which is now under the course of revision. Uh, what motivated Galantner to write this wa was in large part a contemporaneous debates over race and affirmative action in, uh, in the United States. Um, Jacobson's, Gary Jacobson's, The Wheel of Law uh, on Religion State Relations in India, again, an excellent book. Uh, but again, one of the motivations for that book was the fact that similar issues were playing out in the United States, and he was fascinated by making comparisons between India and the US. Uh, and then Sandy Fredman at Oxford, um, her book, Human Rights Transformed on Social and Economic Rights, uh, again, has a, a chapter on, uh, on the Supreme Court of India's jurisprudence on economic and social rights. Uh, but the, the scholarly discussion of which that book contributes uh, is, is, was launched by uh, the inclusion of economic and social rights in the South African constitution. And so India itself, uh, which had a, a, an experience with economic and social rights litigation that was a decade older than South Africa's itself, didn't launch, launch that discussion, uh, although it is an important element of it. And again, the source material in most of this work consists of court judgments. So if you look then at comparative politics studies uh, of South Asia, uh, we see um, a, a parallel set of issues, although somewhat distinct. Uh, and so on the one hand, uh, there is a large and vibrant literature uh, rooted in comparative politics uh, on South Asia, much larger than the literature in comparative constitutional law. Uh, but there are a number of salient features of this body of work which in aggregate contribute to the inadequate attention to constitutionalism in South Asia. Uh, first, um, there is a problem of jurisdictional uh, selectivity, uh, although not nearly as much of a problem uh, as in comparative constitutional law. Uh, so there is, uh, there, is, there is a large body of work in India. Uh, there's also um, work on Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Less work, unfortunately, on Nepal. Uh, and I can't speak to Bangladesh. Um, but the, the style of scholarship is focused on single jurisdictions, uh, often treated in isolation from one another. Uh, the work uh, in comparative politics, uh, on the comparative politics of South Asia is usually done by country specialists who often lack interest or expertise uh, across jurisdictions. Uh, there is not much work that is genuinely regional. The regionally oriented work that exists is on questions of regional economic, uh, political, and security um, situations. Uh, but rarely does the regional work address common issues or problems or questions that arise in the domestic politics of those states. Uh, secondly, um, the, the, although constitutional law and politics operates an important place in this literature, um, the, its, its methodological orientation uh, draws upon uh, traditions in political sociology and political economy. Uh, and this has a number of, of consequences uh, for method, uh, institutional focus, and of course the research questions that, that are addressed. Uh, so I, I'm most familiar with kind of political sociological um, stud studies of South Asia. And, and so, and in particular, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with, I, with literatures on the identity-based political mobilization on the basis of caste, religion, language, uh, region, and how, how, those how those discourses and forms of political mobilization conflict with and interact with state-led discourses of nation building and citizenship. And this, uh, these, dis these conflicts uh, between competing claims of identity often play out uh, in the constitutional arena in all these jurisdictions uh, through court litigation, uh, through debates over amendments of constitutional text. But what is interesting is that although scholars are aware of these issues, their work um, isn't very legally inflected. Uh, and so I'll give you some examples. So, so courts 
are widely understood as being important political actors across South Asia, uh, but there is in political science very little detailed analysis of judicial reasoning, uh, either to examine how courts examine as participants in larger political debates over the political salience of competing <coughs> identities, or how um, the strategic calculations made by courts you know, when they adjudicate fraught political disputes that often uh, become packaged as constitutional cases and come into their docket. Um, questions of institutional design, again, are, are often neglected uh, in, in the comparative politics literature on South Asia. So uh, political mobilization around identity-based categories um, across South Asia often carries with it very specific proposals over institutional design that seek to operationalize or, or implement these broader claims of identity. Uh, but these details are often, often glossed over. And moreover, the, the, a slightly different idea, uh, the idea of constitutional rules as strategic resources that set political agendas, either by placing issues on, on the agenda, deferring issues, or removing them entirely, uh, or which also constitute decision-making institutions, and they create rules for how those institutions function is largely missing from how scholars have compared to politics uh, study South Asia. Uh, and, so, uh, and so what this suggests to me is that the research questions and the methods are insufficiently alert uh, to issues highlighted by the literatures on constitutional law, constitutional theory, and constitutional design. Uh, so what do we do going forward? Uh, and so what, what I think we need to think of uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a South Asia-oriented uh, comparative constitutional law and politics that bridges uh, these silos between comparative constitutional law and comparative politics. And what I want to do is explain how that might work with some examples and proposals that have been implied uh, by, what, by much of what I've been saying. Uh, so first, on the question of topics, I, I think instead of letting other jurisdictions set the intellectual agenda for the study of South Asia, uh, we should accept, we should attempt to understand South Asian cases on their own <coughs> terms by looking closely at South Asian materials to discover what the central issues of constitutional politics have been on the subcontinent. There are two goals here. Uh, the first is to sharpen our understanding of South Asian cases or by understanding them from the inside. Uh, but secondly, um, more globally, to place South Asia at the center of a broader conception of the field of comparative constitutional law and politics. Uh, that addresses a broader set of issues than, his, than it has historically been preoccupied. So I'll give you two examples. Uh, linguistic nationalism uh, has largely been ignored uh, in the literature and comparative constitutional law and politics. But in South Asia, of course, it is one of the principal forces that has shaped the reconfiguration of space, uh, pl a political space, both internationally and within states um, in, since the end of the, of the colonial era. And I don't need to explain the details of that to this audience. Uh, a second example would be the constitutional politics of process. And so I, I've spent um, some time examining uh, in some detail Sri Lankan constitutional politics, which as many of you would know uh, has been about the management of competing nationalisms, a statewide uh, Sinhalese uh, nationalism uh, that has um, that has sought to establish uh, a kind of a state in the uh, the image of the Sinhala speaking majority, and and kind of a counter mobilization on the part of the Tamil minority that would seek to re reimagine Sri Lanka uh, in multinational terms, uh, and so this has played out in a number of specific uh, arenas of conflict. So debates over whether Sri Lanka should be a unitary or a federal state, uh, debates over official language policies. But what's interesting is that if one looks specifically at Sri Lankan constitutional materials, there has been a very fierce debate over constitutional process. That is, the, the, the constitutional framework within which these debates about constitutional substance uh, should, uh, should occur. Where the existing framework for constitutional politics has been uh, denounced uh, by Tamil nationalists as not being indifferent or neutral uh, among the potential options for reconfiguring constitutional space uh, in Sri Lanka. And so again, by studying South Asian materials on their own terms, we see that there are two types of breakdown of constitutional order in Sri Lanka. Uh, one that's a, a, based on a fundamental disagreement on constitutional substance, but also one that's based on a disagreement over constitutional process. Uh, and a lack of agreement over process makes getting any agreement on substance impossible. Secondly, um, in terms of institutional focus and source materials, I, I think that scholars of South Asian constitutionalism uh, need to um, 
to produce politically inflected readings of court judgments and lines of cases uh, in the kind of judicial politics tradition uh, in, 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 in the American uh, Law and Political Science Academies. And so uh, as an example of how this, uh, this could be done, uh, so the basic structure doctrine, uh, which we might talk about on the, on the Q&A, uh, has been, was framed by the Indian Supreme Court in a number of rounds of constitutional politics um, um, with, where there, the conflict was the power of, of was Parliament's power of constitutional amendment, uh, and this uh, generated and this has generated an interesting legal literature on the justifications uh, for this type of doc, just, uh, doctrine. And so, Sudhir Krishna Swami's recent book I, I recommend to you as a very solid treatment of the issues. Uh, but what's quite interesting, of course, uh, is that there were different types of issues that animated uh, the, these types of cases. There were debates, constitutional debates over social transformation. Uh, between the court and parliament. But there were also um, another set of debates uh, over political competition and the attempt by uh, Indira Gandhi to manipulate the Indian constitution to insulate herself um, from, from political contestation. Uh, and so these um, lines of cases had very different sorts of receptions by political elites and arguably are quite different. Uh, a politically situated or contextualized reading of these judgments in their broader political context would dramatically enhance our understanding of the role of the court uh, in this episode in, in Indian constitutional politics. Um, Non-court-centered work is also very important uh, in South Asia, and, and a jurocentric, court-centered approach to constitutional law and politics, again, is very limiting. Uh, most of the important questions about language and ling linguistic mobilization have not taken place uh, in the Indian courts, for example. To understand um, the politics of language, one has to read debates in the Constituent Assembly, the report of the Dar Commission, um, the report of the Care Commission, the States Reorganization Commission report, the parliament parliamentary debates in the 1960s over the Official Languages Act of 1963. Uh, and again, one has to de dive, delve deeply into the, into the concrete details of legal and institutional design that were deployed and argued for and proposed uh, in these discussions to in a way that, that would shed light on the complex range of prudential, institutional, and strategic considerations that would deepen our understanding of Indian constitutional law and politics. The Indian constitution itself has been an important agenda-setting device in many of these debates, uh, either by positively placing certain issues on the agenda, such as state official language policy, which was mandated that be addressed at the state level, uh, issue deferral, such as a 15-year de delay or transition rule, on the phasing out of English at the central level, and then also removing certain issues from the agenda, such as the statutory veto that has been given to uh, states that are non-Hindi speaking over uh, English the use of English at the, at the center. Uh, so let me conclude, because I, I think we're out of time, by saying that um, th this type of work that blends law and politics uh, that relies on, that is non-jurocentric non or non-court-centric uh, in its approach um, is, 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 is a work that can be genuinely South Asian and genuinely comparative. Uh, because what I have found uh, in my own research is that many of the topics or issues that arise in the jurisdictions are often, um, often arise um, in more than one case. And so in, in the case of language, although how language has played out is, differs profoundly uh, across South Asia, uh, the political sociology of mobilization around official language status uh, is something that one, where one can find commonalities in countries as, as, as diverse as Pakistan, Nepal, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, and India. A and so uh, there, is a, there is a way uh, in which one can think of a South Asian set of issues and problems without necessarily uh, implying from that that there is um, a South Asian set of solutions. So let me stop there and, and, and we can pursue these themes more in the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, before inviting questions and conversation, I, I want to make one comment about some things that uh, emerged in this discussion and in some of the preliminary uh, papers or uh, idea papers that we've received from other participants. Um, uh, I, I've given the label, it's an imperfect label, but I've given the label to the theme of unstable constitutionalism. Uh, by that, I mean not necessarily commitment to liberal constitutionalism, but uh, a commitment to institutional design as a solution to the various problems. 
the design issues are uh, very large, uh, and I'll just focus on the national versus national federal kinds of issues. Uh, there's an enormous range of design possibilities from a unitary national government to symmetrical or asymmetrical federalism to geographically based or non-geographically based federalism to confederation uh, to this emerging, I don't know, distinction or category of plurinational constitutions as opposed to multicultural ones. Uh, and finally on the agenda is national separatism. Uh, uh, now, what's interesting is, uh, to me, from what we've seen, is that um, the instability appears to lie uh, in an inability to achieve stable agreement on any one of those possibilities, even though each one of them might work in some sense. If you could get agreement on any one of them, it could be implemented in a way satisfactory to everyone. Uh, it, it seems to me the possibility is of what's going on is that these di these disagreements about institutional design are uh, I have it in my notes as a facade for uh, other conflicts, so that people focus on this as a ground for. Uh, breaking down the constitutional process, leading to a breakdown in the constitutional process, uh, when it's not really the design of federalism that they're concerned about. Uh, I think that's something that uh, I will certainly want to explore uh, as we uh, go further with this project. So with that, I would invite questions and comments from the audience, uh, and I will uh, try to notice hands. So first person in back, way back, yeah, with the Harvard teacher. Thank you, everyone, for the presentation. Um, I have a, a quick comment and a question with uh, uh, Mr. Lauti. Uh, from your presentation, uh, it, it's, it's kind of implied that you are an advocate of identity-based federalism. Um, and so I'm assuming that your uh, presentation is in inherently biased and a little distortion of truth. Um, if we assume that we are taking a Nepal as an identity-based federalism and we just set up a structure like that, um, if, we, if we put that into US context, then it is pretty much saying that a person whose last name is Jones will be confined in the state of Massachusetts, and a person whose last name is Kennedy is confined in the state of New York. And uh, we are creating nations within a nation. Um, could you give me some, um, not theoretical but practical uh, advantages of that, that type of model. Um, a second thing that I wanted to state was um, these very people who actually rebelled to write a new constitution, which the war started in 1996, they were the same people who had written the constitution in 1990. So within five years, they were not sure of their own model. A lot of them actually were the participant of writing in that, uh, in, in, in that particular constitution. Um, and a lot of the people who came as, as a rebel and then they associated themselves with a certain identity-based uh, party, it simply implies that they were looking for uh, some type of uh, state governance rule. For example, like India has, where you can create your own state, you know, like Uttar Pradesh state, they have their own chief minister, they have ministers. So it, it is pretty much incrementally increasing the size of the government, nothing really beneficial for the people, considering a country which is really small. Shall I respond? Sure. Well, I guess the first response is, I think we are having this conference in Massachusetts, and I think, I guess, no, I think not a single person is from the, that Massachusetts tribe or whatever. No? All kinds of people are living over here. So I think that sort of concern is, I think, I mean, beyond the realm of, I mean, I don't know. Uh, rational thought or imagination or wh whatever. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, um, and I'll tell you, this kind of fear exists in Nepal. That I'll, I, I'll concede. A lot of people, for various reasons, think that if there is Massachusetts, only people of that tribe would be living in that state, which is not true. So, then with the kind of, I mean, uh, the rebels, the mouse rebels and so on, yeah, definitely, I mean, 
they raised the issues of the identity politics. They supported the cause of the Dalits, the Madeshi, the indigenous nationalities, and so on. And I would consider it was partly because they wanted to expand their organization, their mobilization, and so on. But uh, the issue is uh, with the expanding competition, because the earlier mainstream political parties, both the Nepali Congress and uh, uh, the CP and UML, uh, were not, I mean, both being laid by hill bounds again, uh, were not ready to, I mean, uh, accept uh, these demands of the marginalized groups. But competition emerged from the outside the system, and uh, they might have the mouse might have done to expand their organization. I mean, uh, provide input to their um, uh, re rebellion and so on. But uh, the wh what we see is that the agenda became nationalized and now being discussed and uh, being debated and, and so forth. Thank you. Yes, uh, in the middle, the blue light blue shirt. Yeah. Uh, my question is also to Professor Lavoti. Uh, thanks for a very rich panel, but I, the first question was answered. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, the role of the Maoists, how you know, they did propose to um, you know, triumph over the identity politics, and now you say it's back to identity politics. But you say, I mean, you can, if you want, you can answer it, but I think I got some kind of an answer. My second question is that, has Nepal considered some sort of an interim constitution? Because it's been dragging on for nearly five years now. Um, as Professor Tushnet men mentioned, maybe a plural national uh, constitution or some kind of an interim bill of uh, rights or something, rather than you know, just getting stuck in this constitution-making process. Uh, so, I mean, since I, mean, I answered the first question, I mean, I won't uh, elaborate on it. Uh, the, the second question also, I mean, Right now, Nepal is supposed to be governed by the interim constitution of 2007. So it, it is in place. But the only issue, issue is the political leaders, uh, of the pol political, top political leaders of the major political parties, they don't follow it if it, is, I mean, if, if it doesn't suit them. So for example, uh, now in Nepal has a supposedly a caretaker government led by the chief justice, sitting chief justice, and that doesn't exist in the interim constitution. But for them it was convenient because their immediate opponents would not hate the government that would hopefully hold the elections. So that was more acceptable to all of them because the opposition was not in power. So that way, I mean, Nepal has an interim constitution but the major political parties follow only the, them only when it suits them. So that's, that, that has been the challenge. Even in the, uh, when they could not, I mean, the interim constitution has clearly laid out. If two-thirds of the uh, majority, I mean, decides on a particular issue, that should be adopted. But uh, they were not willing to, they didn't even take that issue to the vote. So it's an interesting case. Um, yes, Rene. Um, uh, the, my question is for Professor, uh, Professor Chaudhary. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you said that um, you wanted to, uh, you feel much more attention is needed to, uh, to uh, ways in which constitutions engage with cultural diversity and specifically talked about language politics. Mm -hmm. uh, some claim that there, there are some unique features to the Indian engagement with public religion and that this has definite constitutional dimensions. Mm. Uh, my own sense is that the claim to the uniqueness of the Indian solution is, are somewhat overstated, but uh, I was wondering whether you find it useful to have a sort of start from Indian experience and then think comparatively about uh, ways in which constitutions engage with the public relevance of religion. You know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, so the answer is I don't know. Um, so the, I, so, so let me just kind of answer your question in two ways. So first of all, so, it's, for, so the work of that in language, I think that some of the solutions that India has come upon to manage language, I don't think you resolve language conflict, you manage it, you live with it, and you channel it, and, and, and kind of cope with it, because it can't be resolved, uh, I think are interesting. 
and have a lot to teach uh, other jurisdictions. So you know, one of the most interesting questions that comes from the, the, the Indian experimentation with with designing official multilingualism is the idea that one should disaggregate official language status uh, into um, to break down the decision of what should be an official language into different spheres. So the language of the legislature, the language of the executive, and then within the executive branch, the, le the internal working language of government as opposed to the language of public services, the language of the court system, and then again within the court system, the language of proceedings as opposed to the language of court judgments, as opposed to the language of legal texts. And so the idea that there is a single decision to be made on official language policy is wrong, and the Indian case proves it. There's not one question. There's a, there's, there's a couple of dozen different questions, and there is actually the decisions can be made quite independently of each other. And it helps to complexify and diffuse tension uh, by kind of broadening the range of choice and the range of questions and considerations that go into designating languages as having official status or not. So it's very possible for the state to be very multilingual in public service provision, even though it can't really offer, it can't operate internally in more than one or two languages. No country can. So, um, and that is a very important lesson uh, for other multi, radically multilingual states. You know, it's the one lesson I think that the Nepalese um, might heed well, you know, where there is a lot of debate over official language policy that's tied up with this identity-based federalism, right, which has a lot of controversy surrounding it, to say the least. And, uh, and so that's one set of issues. On, on the public status of religion, yeah, although, you know, I don't think India is unique in grappling with these questions, you know? I mean, I think that, you know, I, I think that people who have kind of a church-state anti-establishment clause mindset, the United States, might think that India looks very unique. But in fact, it's the United States that's quite unique. You know, in its kind of strong versions of neutral, strong claims to neutrality and the separation of church and state. If one looks at a lot of European states, um, the, 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 the constitutional architecture of the relationship between organized religion um, and public institutions looks much more familiar to an Indian or a scholar of India. So I, I think the way I would, the, so, the, so the way I would frame things would be to say, listen, you know, India is quite different from, let's say, the United States, which is at one extreme uh, on these questions, or purports to be at least constitutionally, but in fact, maybe um, India is not the outlier, right? Uh, and, and let's look, let's use this comparison as a, as a, as a, as a provocation or a motivation to taxonomize uh, the ways in which constitutions organize the relationship between state um, and religion, and in fact, maybe India it would be a prod to complexifying what we think to be the reality to show that it's actually, a, you know, a much more diverse world out there, and India might be more paradigmatic or normal uh, in that sense. We have time for one more question. Uh, so on this side, yeah. Sometimes can't <coughs> Constitution within India is being amended because of agitation. I vaguely remember that sometime in late 1950s when I was just a very young student, because someone in somewhere in South India, either Tamil Nadu, burnt himself agitating Hindi as the sole official language and later on then the first Prime Minister Nehru he reconciled and mm. agreed for the continuation of English. Uh, so now in a democratic country like India. So I wondered why it could, could not have been done in a peaceful way, uh, even though a democracy is very well flourishing there. And uh, one other comment I want to make is, I believe it was in Tamil Nadu recently, about seven or eight years ago, they banned religious conversion. I don't know how far it was constitutional. And later on, again, that party lost in the power. And I believe, again, that religious conversion freedom is restored. Thank you. The first part. Do you want to answer this? The linguistic reorganization or? Um, the, I, I mean, just on, on the first question, I, I can't, I mean, it's difficult to answer why, why it was violent. I mean, it's just a rambunctious democracy. But I think that the, but, but you're right, a lot of the, dip, I mean, in the 50s, and um, in the early years of the Republic, there were a lot of amendments to the Constitution regarding the creation of new states. Um, 
why those amendments happened, um, I mean, one short answer to that is that the Indian Constitution actually sets a very low threshold for the creation of new states. And you could argue that, in a sense, that's worked. Um, because at, in um, it seems to have, the creation of new states seems to have at least resolved those particular, um, the particular controversies that, that, that were involved in the 50s and the 60s with linguistic nationalism. I mean, there are other cases, Telangana being the most striking example, um, where a constitutional solution hasn't been fully formed, even though there were amendments on Andhra Pradesh since the 70s. But in a sense, that, that problem is really political. So I don't know if the amendments do anything except just mirror that. Um, on, on the second question, I my, so I'm, I'm, I'm not fully informed of the specifics, but my sense is that the conversion controversy is actually about presidential assent. So the states have been passing laws that the president hasn't been assenting to. And so I think I think the matter fully hasn't reached constitutional resolution yet. That's my that's my sense of it, but I might be wrong on that. Well, uh, we have, uh, as one of the co-organizers of the conference, uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that there are questions from the audience that unfortunately for this event will have to remain unanswered, but perhaps will uh, be addressed in the larger project that uh, we are uh, instituting with this event. So I thank you for your attention, and uh, I hope you uh, will find the remainder of the conference interesting as well.